welcome to yet another thrilling episode of Misfits here at the Recycle Garage in sunny Santa Cruz, California, USA. Hey everyone, I am Liza. And I'm not Liza. So, um... <laughs> Wait, who are you? Who am I, man? Who's anyone? This is Emma. Hello, darlings. So we're here to answer your questions and uh, drop some knowledge on you about motorcycles. The one thing that is, I think, plays the biggest role in both of our lives. We're, we love everything motorcycles, not just riding them. Oh, no. It's, it's, riding's only part of it. We love riding bikes, but wrenching on them is just, it's fabulous. Exactly. So we're here to answer questions and to help you out. If you have a question, you can send it to Ask the Misfits. That's spelled M I S S F I T S at gmail.com. Yes, yes, yes. But today, this wasn't a question we had, but this is some general information that you wanted to share. Yeah, um, I want to make absolutely clear the most important tool you have when working on your bike at home are these and this, but you need help. Tools! And tools are often the most misunderstood thing. They're, they're vitally important, but you need to understand what they are, how they work, what they do, and how to pick the right tool for a job you're doing on your bike. And here at the Recycle Garage, I often say we're not teaching motorcycle repair as much as we're teaching tools. Right. And it's about those little tricks and knowing what tool to use when that can completely empower somebody. Right, exactly. And picking the right tool for the job is step one. For the most fundamental task, the simplest task, if you want to change the oil on your bike and you're using the wrong tools, you're starting off on the wrong foot. So we're going to just deal with some very, very basic tools. Really the minimum that you should have in your kit if you want to attempt working on your bike. We're going to go through each of them, tell you what they are, what they do, and where you're going to encounter them. Great. So let's start with screwdrivers. Um, they're a vital part of how bikes go together. And so we'll start with often referred to as a Phillips screwdriver, and that's, it's half the picture. So let's talk about Phillips screwdrivers and the various sizes they come in. Now we can see, if we look at these three screwdrivers, they've all got a star head. These two are the same length, this is longer, but that's not what I'm talking about. The actual ends are different sizes. You can clearly see this is the smallest diameter, this is the middle, and this is the largest diameter. It's vital that you use the right size screwdriver for the job. If you're trying to undo the case screws in a vintage Japanese bike, and you're trying it with this or this, you're going to get nowhere. Number three, number two, number one. One is the smallest. This, the number one, is the least common of all of them. The only place you'll find number one screws on a vintage Japanese bike or a vintage European bike are turn signal lenses, maybe right. inside the switch gear if you're actually pulling the switch gear down. Do you need to pull the switch gear down? Well, yeah, sometimes. Um, if you push the horn button and nothing happens, you might have got corroded contacts in the switch cube itself. So that's where you'll need your number one. Number two, this is quite common. Number two, the actual switch clusters themselves are a clam shell that go around the handlebar and usually they're held on with a couple of screws. That's your number two. Most screws holding a carburetor together, again, a number two. Most electrical components, if there are screws holding them on, it's going to be the number two. Final one is the number three. This is very common on the older bikes. 
The side cases on the engine are almost always held together with number three screws and they're tight. So there's a couple of things we need to talk about. The first off, you've got to make sure that you're using a number three, but that's only half of the picture. The Japanese manufacturers came up with a system from the very, very early days and the, the screw system was called the JIS, Japanese Industry Standard. Now, if you look at a screw for a Japanese manufactured bike, you'll see a tiny, tiny little dot on the head of the screw. The seemingly doesn't do anything. That's actually telling you it's a JIS screw. And if you want perfect results, you need a JIS screwdriver. This is a JIS number two. We can tell it's a JIS largely because there's only a couple of manufacturers that make them and Vessel is one of them. That is also a JIS screwdriver. However, this one is different. They're both number twos. This one is slightly shorter and you kind of notice that this one's got a little bit more weight to it. It's also got a metal cap on the end and that serves a very, very important purpose. The metal cap is on the end and the screwdriver carries more weight because there's actually a metal shaft that goes all the way through the plastic handle and into the shank of the screwdriver. What do you think that might be? Whack it with a hammer. You got it exactly. Sometimes screws, all they need to help come undone is a little bit of shock from a hammer. We're not talking about an impact. An impact driver does two things. When you whack it with a hammer, it actually turns it. You may not need that. Just the shock of being hit with a hammer oftentimes is enough to loosen the screw. And that's what this is for. Well, you forgot about the other type of screwdriver. I know. Your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> no, my least favorite. And this is something that I find um, causes the most problems and heartaches for people right. who are wrenching. Knowing when it's time to throw away a tool is hard. And in this case, this one is worn out. I, it looks like it's been beat with a hammer, the tip broke off. When you have a worn or broken tool, you can strip it and make heartache for you. So this one has to be thrown away. Jesus, oh my good lord. <laughs> <laughs> Smashing up the film crew. Um, so that covers Phillips screws and screwdrivers that need to be thrown away. You know, flat blade screws are not that common. You'll find them on European bikes. You'll find them on English bikes. The only thing that applies in all of these cases, when you're trying to undo a screw, make sure that you push the screwdriver into the screw as you're turning. So the action is kind of that. If you're just trying to turn it, often it'll pop out. Let's move on to pliers. Pliers are a very old fashioned tool. They still have a place in motorcycling. We'll start with the channel locks. So why would you think you'd need a channel lock? Well, it's adjustable for many different sizes. Right, and that's a perfect description of why you would use it. If we think about the strength that we have within our hand, our, our grip is strongest when it's close to being closed. Going like that is far stronger than trying to close from a wider opening. So, if we're picking up something small, we've got a great deal of strength with them at their shortest setting. If we want to pick up something larger, you can see that the span wouldn't be sufficient. So we open them up and we can pick something up which is larger diameter and we've still got that strength that we can hold it very, very tightly. I like channel locks. The great example of things that you can use channel locks for is pulling split pins out of axles, um, grabbing parts that are rusted shut. They serve a lot of functions. The only thing to remember about them, the jaws 
are actually serrated. So if you grab something with these, you're going to mark it. If you don't mind, that's fine. But if you don't want to mark it, you might want to try something else. You know why I like them? Why do you like them? Because they come in different sizes! Oh, now that is a pair of channel locks. Look at, look, let me see if I can get your head in here. Oh, <laughs> ah. Now that's some channel locks. Right, uh, but the principle is the same. When we have them on their widest setting, and the power we have to grab something that big, it's wonderful. So if you had even an axle nut that really has been pounded and rounded off, you might be able to get it with these. So everything has a place. Let's move to the needle nose. I love these things. At my job, everyone knows I'm a professional motorcycle mechanic. I've been doing it for a very long time. I use these things every day and I use them pretty much on every job because they serve such a vital purpose. A motorcycle there's a lot going on in a very small area and a lot of times you have to reach a hose and pull off a hose that's way back there or reach inside a carburetor slide to pull a needle out and these are perfect. They will go where your fingers won't. And again if we think about leverage there's a long handle with a very slender tip you can actually grab pretty tight with these. They're perfect for, as an example, if you want to do the throttle body synchronization on a sport bike, mm -hmm. you've got vacuum hoses you need to pull off, and they are way in there and way up there. You shine a flashlight in and you pull the hoses off with this, attach your vacuum sticks, off you go. I love these things. This is one of the most valuable tools in my kit. And I like them, again, talk about variety of sizes. I have very small, little thin needle. Uh, you also can get them with a curved, an right. offset tip. And the curved tip ones are great if you're kind of going round the corner. Dykes! <laughs> yes. I knew you'd like that one. Actually, these are diagonal cut pliers. Exactly. Often referred to as dykes, but the correct name is diagonal cutters. What we have here a chunky short blades with a fairly sharp edge. Now these are great for cutting. In fact, you use these on your toenails. I do indeed. Followed by an angle grinder to get the perfect finish. <laughs> <laughs> but they've got so many uses. Um, you can cut hoses with them. You can cut electrical wires with them. I actually fit the ends of electrical wires with these. If you know what you're doing, when you're actually fitting a, an end to a wire, you can actually use the tip. And I like them because they're short, they're very, very powerful. And the reason I like these the most is they're made in Sheffield. So they're English. So you want to know what I found these are really good for? Tell me. Pulling staples out of a seat pan. Perfect. And in that case, you're able to grab the staple and just twist and, and it pulls it out. And pull it. So, a v again, a very, very valuable tool. Now, we have one more plier left. Now, this one... <laughs> Your favorite. Actually, we have a rule in the garage. No one is allowed to use a vice grip because I find this tool is the most misused tool in the shop. It can do the most damage to a bolt or a nut and that's irreparable. It can, right. again, make the problem worse. So you have to be under adult supervision to use vice grips. So let's talk about vice grips and what they are. And when to use them. And when to use them. So these things have been around since really the 1930s. And back in the 1930s, metal technology wasn't as good as it is now. Um, bolt heads were softer, wrenches were softer, and bolt heads got stripped out and rounded off a lot more easily than they do now. So we needed a way to get them undone. And the answer was the vice grip. And so what it is, it's two hardened steel jaws 
with a serrated edge, but there's actually two curvatures here. There's a large curvature and a smaller curvature. So you can grab larger diameter and smaller diameter here. There's an adjustment on the back, which will allow for you to grab different size things. And a spare component <laughs> from the last time it was used. <laughs> These things do have their place, but it's a last resort. When you want to reach for these, it's absolutely when everything else has failed. I'm glad you said that. That is exactly what I tell people. This is the last tool you go to. And sometimes it will get you out of a situation that no other, other tool could. The thing to remember about a vice grip, when you've reached for that and you've grabbed a part of your motorcycle with this, that's the end of that part you've grabbed. It's going to be serrated, it's going to be nasty, it's going to be ugly. If that doesn't matter to you, that's fine, and you just want to get it off, that's great. But this is a destroyer of nuts and bolts. Does it have a place? Absolutely it does, because sometimes you won't have a choice. This is the only way to get that bolt out. But once you're done with that bolt, you throw it away and get a new one. Exactly. Well, Emma, you've done it again. You shared uh, your amazing knowledge with us, and I thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. And hopefully you got something out of that, too. I love buying tools, and I think really the, the biggest takeaway here is have as many tools as you can, because sometimes when I have trouble getting a screw out, just getting another screwdriver might have a little sharper edge with a bite or the better size or you might get better leverage with a different size wrench. Go to town, buy tools, have fun with it. And remember, every single person is different. The span of your hand might be different. Your technique may be different. Find something that works comfortably for you. But the big thing is, work on your bike. It's part of motorcycling. If you want to bond with your motorcycle, which I know everybody does, there's nothing better than working on it. There really isn't. There you go. And if you get yourself into a jam while working on your bike, go ahead and send us an email at askthemisfits, M-I-S-S-F-I-T-S, at gmail.com, and we'll answer your question and help you out. My promise to you, no matter how big a jam you get yourself in, I'll get you out of it. There you go.